So welcome everyone this month to February Net Chatter. Um, my name is Selena Robinson and I run Net Cancer Foundation, which was set up by my husband, Simon. Um, so thank you to this month's speaker and I'll pass you over to Kate for the introduction. Thank you. Okay, uh, so yeah, hello everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Yasmin Kemkem, who is from uh, Cynthia, and this is where I'm going to butcher all your names now, I apologise in advance, <laughs> <laughs> and an ADU's lab at uh, King's College London, and uh, she's a postdoctoral research associate, associate there, and she's going to be uh, talking to us today about um, the work they're doing on understanding neuroendocrine development um, and helping generate tools uh, to study tumor genesis. So uh, please take it away and hopefully we'll have uh, lots of time and lots of questions at the end. Just a reminder, if anyone has any questions as they go, feel free to put it in the chat and I will pick it up at the end. So thanks again for agreeing and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Kate. Can you all see my screen? Yes. And sorry, just preparing laser pointer. All right, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to give this talk. Well, where I will address how development and tumor genesis can actually be very much linked. So these two processes have several things in common. And they both, it all starts with one cell, which depending on the cues it receives will either go on to um, have changes in gene expression and then go on to differentiate and proliferate and to give rise to either a, sorry, a healthy tissue. I apologize, but I think I'm having a problem seeing my slides. All right, sorry. So these cells, will, the one cell, depending on the cues it gets, will either go on to generate healthy tissue and development or it can give rise to a cancer stem cell, which will then go on to divide and uh, give rise to a tumor in cancer. And these two processes can be driven by the same uh, signaling molecules, such as WINTs and FGFs. Um, <clears throat> and I want you to note that any progenitor cell has the potential to become a cancer stem cell and go on to develop a tumor. And one example, where one of the signaling pathways implicated in either processes is altered um, is adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma. And in 60% of patients with these tumors present a mutation in the CTNNB1 gene, which um, results in an accumulation of abnormal beta catenin. And although this is not a neuroendocrine tumor, it is the most common pituitary tumor in children. And it is very aggressive and has a very high rate of morbidity and recurrency. And when we say, and when we induce the same tumor in a mouse model, we see that we can recapitulate um, the phenotype of the tumor, as you can see here, with um, clusters of beta catenin expressing cells, um, and also similar structures between mouse and human tumors, such as my, um, microcystic changes and nodules here. Now, what about this signaling, the wind signaling pathway in development? So if we go back to pituitary development, our group has shown that um, all endocrine pituitary cells derive from a stem cell expressing SOX2. And the SOX2 cells not only give rise to all the differentiated cells, cell, stem differentiated cells of the pituitary during development, there's a proportion of stem cells that remains present in the postnatal pituitary, and it will contribute to pituitary turnover by um, self-renewing, but also by giving rise to differentiated cells of the pituitary in the adult, like seen here in lineage tracing experiments done at five weeks old, where uh, green SOX2 cells give rise to a hormone expressing pituitary cells. And the way the SOX2 cells contribute um, to the pituitary homeostasis is, is via the same pathway, the wind beta catenin signaling pathway. And our group has shown that um, when we delete, when we stop the SOX2 stem cells from sending out wind signals by deleting windless, a protein that is needed um, to send out wind signals, this leads to a significant drop um, in the proliferation of cells neighboring the SOX2 cells, but also the SOX2 cells, cells stem cells themselves. 
and this has confirmed this colonogenic um, experiments where when we played SOX2 cells without wind and in the presence of wind signaling, we see that the ones that see wind um, form bigger colonies. So what this paper shows is that um, <clears throat> SOX2 cells need to be able to send out paracrine signals, wind molecules, both to self-renew, but also to drive proliferation in neighboring cells. And when we alter this pathway in this um, stem cell population, this induces large tumors in the pituitary. But interestingly, the, these tumors are not comprised and composed of SOX2 positive cells. These tumors are, are derived from other cells which are supposed to receive wind signals from the SOX2 population. So this is a non-cell autonomous tumor inducing process where the mutation, even if it affects the SOX2 cells, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't, it's so SOX2 cells will not themselves give rise to tumors, but the signals they send out to their neighboring cells will be the one alters and those neighboring cells will go on to develop tumors. So this is an example of a signaling pathway um, when, which when altered will give rise to a um, to a tumor in a non-cell autonomous um, way. So this is an example of that, but I will show you another example where when we alter a signaling pathway, SOX2 cells can directly contribute to tumor genesis, and that's the HIPPO pathway. So the HIPPO signaling pathway is also um, a signaling pathway that is necessary for proper pituitary development. And when we knock out LATS, which is an enzyme that is upstream of the effector of the HIPPO pathway YAP, we see that this leads to large tumors. And when we knock it out specifically in the SOX2 positive cell types, this induces tumors, which this time are comprised of SOX2 positive cells, as you can see with colocalization of the SOX2 staining here in green and of YAP. So to summarize, the stem cells of an endocrine gland can contribute to pituitary, in this case, pituitary turnover in two ways. First one is being by a direct contribution where the SOX2 cells will self-renew and also give rise to, commit, to committed cell types and progenitors. But what our group found is that <clears throat> these cells also act as um, paracrine signaling hubs, whereby they send out wind signals to neighboring cells, which will then go on and drive um, proliferation. And if we perturbate these developmental pathways, this can lead to tumor genesis. And the role of stem cells as a paracrine signaling hub is a very important concept that we learned while studying development that we need to keep in mind when we're trying to understand the pathogenesis of neuroendocrine tumors, such as pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. So PPGLs <clears throat> are a rare neuroendocrine tumor, tumors which arise from neurocrest derived structures. So they can derive from the medulla for pheochromocytomas and the paraganglia for, uh, for, um, for paragangliomas. And in our group, we're interested in the SDHB mutation related tumors as these account for the most aggressive form of PPGLs. As SDHP mutations are present in six to eight percent of tumors, and up to seventy percent of the mutation carriers will go on to develop metastasis, and we are really lacking models to study these cancers, and this is a challenge we're trying to overcome in the lab uh, to try and better understand what's happening when PPGL during PPGL onset. And the question we would like to answer is: What is the cell of origin of these tumors? Is it a cancer stem cell? And when we go back to development, we know that um, both these structures, so the paraganglia and the adrenal medulla, both derive from uh, an embryonic um, migratory cell population, the neural crest. And also, interestingly, the tumors seem to be located along the neural crest migra migratory, <laughs> migratory route. Um, so we would like to identify the cell of origin of these tumors. But these tumors tend to appear later on in life and not in childhood. So the first question we wanted to address is whether there is a stem cell population in the postnatal mid, uh, adrenal medulla. 
So just a reminder of the cellular key of the adrenal medulla. So it's composed of adrenaline and noradrenaline producing chromaffin cells, preganglionic uh, innervation and tramedullary neuron, and a population of uh, glial-like cells, which are called the tentacular cells. Um, previous studies in, in, in silico have shown that the tentacular cells of the medulla can be of um, derived from Schwann cell precursors, could give rise to chromaffin cells and neurons. Other in vitro studies have shown that the tentacular cells not only can give rise to chromaffin cells and neurons, but they can also cell free new. And these are the two properties of a stem cell. But so far, there is no solid in vivo proof of the stem cell potential of the tentacular cell. And this is <clears throat> what we would like to address. So we perform single cell RNA sequencing um, in um, postnatal adrenals, and we have identified SOX2 as being expressed in a subset of the cystentacular cell, and it seems to be uh, expressed in the least differentiated um, proportion of the cystentacular cell. We have confirmed overlap between SOX2 um, and other known markers of the cystentacular cell, such as S100B here and SOX10 here. And using lineage tracing, we also confirmed that the SOX2 positive cells of the adrenal medulla are neurocrest derived as they are derived from Wnt1 cells. But to address whether these cells can behave as stem cells in the postnatal adrenal medulla, uh, we performed lineage tracing experiment on SOX2 pre ERT2 ROSA26 MTMG mice. And in these mice, um, when we inject tamoxifen, from then onwards, all the SOX2 positive cells and their daughters will be labeled in green. So analysis have shown that postnatally, SOX2 positive cells of the adrenal medulla expand, but they're also able to give rise to both neurons and chromaffin cells in vivo in adult mice. So this is the first solid in vivo evidence of the uh, stem cell potential of the SOX2 uh, cells of the adrenal medulla. We have also confirmed that they're not only present in mouse, but they're also present in human, and they persist throughout life in both. And there are also reports in the literature, and we have also confirmed in the lab that the SOX2 cells are present in STHB, uh, metastatic and non-metastatic STHB tumors. So I've showed you that these cells, the SOX2 positive cells of the adrenal medulla, they persist throughout life in mouse and human. They expand and give rise to differentiated cells in vivo. And they seem to be present in some of the SDHB tumors. So they're the best candidate to be a cancer stem cell. So to investigate their potential, um, we have established an in vitro culture system where only SOX2 positive cells uh, grow. Um, as adherent culture. So here, when we plate SOX2 positive cells and SOX2 negative cells, only SOX2 positive cells are able to form beautiful colonies. And to assess their stem cell and oncogenic potential, we referred back to a, a very old but beautiful technique, which is the CAM assay for coriolantoic membrane. And this is a system that was invented over 100 years ago in 19... 11 and it was the system was borrowed to developmental biology so the chick develops surrounded by a coriolantoic membrane which is a vascularized structure and we can seed cells into the air bubble on top of the cam to assess their stem or oncogenic behavior and perform a several a range of assay to study tumor growth or angiogenesis or even invasion and metastasis by directly looking at how these cells can invade the chick or even the lower cam. So we have adapted this uh, system in the lab and after exposing the cam, uh, we have seeded SOX2 um, EGFP, so SOX2 cells labeled in green of the adrenal, of the postnatal adrenal medulla. And these cells have given rise to an a tissue that seems 
to be vascularized and also a tissue that expresses seem to maintain some endogenous AGFP, so SOX2 expression. But we also found that in this tissue, some cells had differentiated and started expressing markers of differentiated adrenal medulla, such as chromogranin A or TH here in PNMT. These cells also give rise to neurons, as seen here with the beta-3 tubulin um, staining. So this was a further proof of the stem cell potential of these um, adrenal medullary SOX2 cells uh, in the living system. Now to investigate their oncogenic potential, we are now able to um, genetically edit them and delete SDHB specifically in these cells by first isolating, uh, isolating them in culture, as I showed you earlier, and then by performing CRISPR-Cas9 to de successfully delete SDHB in these cells. And then we can go on to test whether these cells can behave as cancer stem cells and aggressively invade the chick after a CAM assay. So just to summarize on this part, so the SOX2 positive cells of the medulla have shown you that they are stem cells and that they can be expanded and gene edited and differentiated from both mass and I haven't shown you, but we can also um, isolate them from human samples. And I have shown you that the CAM assay is a, a powerful tool that we can use to study the invasion and the metastasis of SDHB mutant cells. We have also generated an extensive bank of human SOX2 positive cells of the adrenal medulla, um, and we are currently gene editing, editing them for SDHP, and we're also generating a mouse model to, to specifically drive um, a mutation in SDHP, specifically in the SOX2 um, positive cells of the adrenal medulla. But my main take-home message today is that um, signaling pathways which are present in development, need very fine tuning as they can really be the switch between a stem cell and a cancer stem cell in your endocrine organs. And I wanted to emphasize that by using developmental biology, we can understand the regulation of the stem cells and how they can play a role in the pathogenesis of neuroendocrine tumors. And of course, with this, I thank you for listening and everyone involved in these studies, uh, especially my mentor, Cynthia. And of course, all our collaborators within Kings and outside and all of our funders and the Net Cancer Foundation for their invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for going uh, through that. I mean, before we get on to questions, I don't know whether Cynthia, you wanted to introduce yourself as well, because I'm not sure many uh, people on this uh, group will uh, know much about you. And then we can have maybe just a general discussion about um, all the work that was uh, presented. Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. Um, well done, Yasmin. That was a nice talk. And um, I I guess I'm Cynthia. Um, <laughs> and what, I, what we do in the lab is, um, I think Yasmin has touched upon the main topics. Um, we focus on stem cell biology <laughs> primarily in the endocrine system. Um, so we work quite a lot with the pituitary gland, um, the adrenal medulla, bit, the adrenal cortex. Um, and we've touched upon thyroid um, uh, a few moons back, um, but we, we, we're not doing that anymore. Um, mostly because of lack of funding. Um, but what we're, what we're interested in is making mouse models of, of disease and making um, just generating tools that people can use to study disease. And what is the switch really that drives what Yasmin said, that, that stem cell to cancer stem cell um, attribute. And it's all to do for us with signaling. Um, so um, I think that my... I touch upon, you know, different parts of maybe neuroendocrinology and what I really care about is the molecular biology aspect. Um, so I'm not clinical. I'm a developmental biologist by, by trade. Um, so I, but I do have quite a lot of exposure, I guess, in these environments with uh, the different societies, such as the European Society for Endocrinology and sit through a lot of clinical talks. And what we like to, to try and do a bit more in the future is to connect with groups that are doing more translational and clinical research, because we're doing quite a lot of basic 
research, uh, connect with patient advocate groups and, and have a better grasp of what it is that's missing, not just our scientific curiosity to be fulfilled, but what's missing really in the in the field that we could lend a hand in and try and try and answer those questions. Great, thank you. Um, well, I mean, if anyone's got any questions as we go, feel free to chip in. Um, I'm conscious that like there's quite a few complex sort of areas that are covered in this. So I was kind of thinking that, oh, okay, so I'm, Simon's going in straight away. Go on then, Simon. No, 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 uh, just go just go on. Uh, I, I just... Uh... Oh, no, I was just going to say that um, I think, first of all, I just want to say that, um, you know, this is really interesting because I think um, stem cells in cancer development have been talked about for a long time and you know there's been different issues with you know what cells do these things arise from how do we treat them do these cells persist which is how you know you have problems with resistance to drugs and all of those sorts of things so it's really good to see that models are kind of developing in this um area now i, I have a lot of questions that i could ask so simon i don't know if you want to go ahead first before i um i start going for it <laughs> No, just just go. Um, I, I will follow up with with some questions. Maybe we have some overlaps. We'll see. <laughs> okay, if you're sure. Um, I mean, so I suppose first of all, um, I was interested in sort of. So you're saying uh, about SOX two, kind of uh, being the main uh, driver behind this, and uh, it's it's kind of interesting how you're saying that that can influence the cells around it as well as just necessarily those cells themselves. So, I mean, I think for some of the people that maybe have less experience with those, I just kind of wondered if you wanted to give a few more details about the consequence and how that can affect sort of the other sort of cells around it and the microenvironment and how kind of the secreting of that Wnt signal can actually drive the cells around it to become tumorigenic, because I'm, I think that's a new concept to maybe a lot of people here. So maybe just to kind of give a few more details around how you think that could be working and why Wnt is so important in that process. Of course, I, yeah, you can hear me. Um, I can reply in terms of concepts. I have not, I cannot tell you what exactly happens in the adrenal medulla, but what we know from the pituitary gland is that the SOX2 cells use Wnt signals that they send over to neighboring cells and this will have an effect on their proliferation okay but this is one of the things that our group has shown but there can be other processes that can be also controlled by these signals such as differentiation of a lineage taking over another lineage so contributing to sulfate decision of neighboring cells um, so because the same signals can be implicated in many different aspects of sulfate determination and also proliferation this this tuning seems to be very, very fine. And we need to think of two things. It's that the dosage of signals that the cells see and also the time window at which they see it. Because if signaling is altered throughout embryonic development or if it's altered in the postnatal life or later on in life, this can have different effects on neighboring cells. Now, how this directly relates to PPGLs, we are not sure yet, but it could be what I mean is that we're using a, uh, a system now to assess the tumorigenic potential of isolated SOX2 cells when we take them out, select them, and use them in a CAM. That's one thing. But because we're also generating a mouse model, when we are altering these cells, if what we're seeing is different from when we induce this mutation in isolated cells, that we should always keep in mind somewhere in our minds that this could be because they're having an influence of other cells, which then could be also of origin of these tumors. So all in all, time sensitive, dosage sensitive, complex, whether it's in vivo or ex vivo, and we need to dissect the molecular mechanisms. I don't know if this answers all of yep. that. We don't know more than what we know. <laughs> that's perfect I think I kind of what I was uh, interested to highlight was that how people talk about mutations occurring in a cell type and that leading to tumors etc and kind of there's this assumption that one cell starts dividing and then that makes a tumor etc and I think what's an interesting concept here for everyone to hear is that what you're saying is that that stem cell can actually 
produce factors that can cause cells around it to proliferate instead. Um, and, if, you know, and of course, I'm guessing, um, you know, we talk about heterogeneity a lot. Uh, so one tumor can have lots of different, um, you know, cell types and, you know, different mutations and things that are going on in different areas of the tumor. So I wonder whether, you know, if these stem cells, whether you think there's just one stem cell that goes wrong, that we put these factors out and affect the cells around it, or whether multiple can go wrong simultaneously, which is how you can end up with all of these um, sort of, you know, heterogeneous tumors. Well, well, this would need, mean that we would need a thorough characterization of the stem cell population of the adrenal medulla. That would be step one. And of course, I mean, yes, a heterogeneity of the stem cell compartment could be at the origin of the heterogeneity of the tumors that we see, or maybe a heterogeneity of the cell signaling, even emanating from one cell type, can also explain this heterogeneity or a combination of both plus the different timings at which mutations occur. And if we also add the component of a first hit and a second hit, so all these levels of complexity can all add up and explain heter the heterogeneity of tumors. I mean, it's such a complex process. Can I can I can I add a little bit to that? Yeah, please well, do. <laughs> so I think I think what John brings up in the chat that you know we need to be open to multicellular systems biology. Absolutely, you know this is this is the way forward. Really. Um, so when in talking about the paracrine signals. Um, what we learned with adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma previously, and I mean, this is a good example because it's a good example of cell non-autonomous tumour formation, right? But there, there's quite a lot of um, evidence that this is happening in other tumours as well, um, such as hepatocellular carcinoma and skin, skin cancer in, in some of the blood cancers. But in a lot of these cases, the driver is... A mutation that activates wnt beta in signaling. What we found in the previous research was if we induced in the mouse mutations in beta catenin that are activating, then we get the tumors forming. If we induce mutations in APC, which is another component of, of the destruction complex for beta catenin, so it also elevates the wind signaling pathway, but it doesn't do so at the same level. So this artificial, this this activating beta catenin mutation is really high wind signaling. The APC is a little bit lower, but it's still, you know, still abnormal. We get the same histological phenotypes, but we don't get the tumors forming as readily in mouse. And it it didn't seem to be just because the levels of beta catenin were not, or the levels of wind signaling were not high enough in those cells. It's because those cells didn't transform from a stem cell to a tumor initiating or cancer stem cell, right? And the process by which they did this transformation was to undergo through senescence. So the beta catenin mutation seemed to make them senescent. And this senescent phenotype where they've stopped dividing can go two ways. The cell can just stay senescent or it can go to into what's called SASP, which is a senescence associated secretory phenotype. And it seems that these cells that have this very high paracrine action normally in normal homeostasis, when they do undergo this, the, these tumorigenic mutations, they go into SASP. And going into SASP means that they secrete an, an enormous amount of cytokines and chemokines, and that attracts other cells into the region that causes endothelial um, stem cells to proliferate, for example. So we get a lot of cells that are expressing endothelial markers, and you get, you know, you get whole immune infiltration. And in humans, you also have reaction from the brain. So you've got a glial reactive tissue infiltrating the tumor as well. So what we don't know is if going into SASP is, can happen in other cells as well. So we know in the pituitary in mouse models, it doesn't seem to happen. It's only in the stem cells and it's only in a proportion of stem cells that seem to be normally secreting. But how does that translate to other organs? We don't know because we don't know if more than the pituitary gland and the adrenal that we've investigated, if in the other organs we have stem cells that normally have a paracrine function. So this is something for us to be investigating, especially in the context of neuroendocrine tumors. 
Um, and because the results are promising from skin and, and from hepatocellular carcinoma with the Wnt mutations, we think this might be the case in, in, other, in other organs as well. So it's something, you know, we're not going to do it, you know, it's just too much. So other people need to get interested, but we have to put the papers out there because at the moment what we're working on is the mechanism of secretion, because if you prevent that secretion, you can prevent the tumour formation. Sometimes the patients can have multiple surgeries, the tumour keeps recurring, and that's because the cell that's initiating is remaining back in the body because surgeons are trying to preserve as much of the normal organ as possible. Well, that was going to be one of my next questions about what you feel about treatment, because again, I think people have been talking about stem cells and how that's <clears throat> involved in recurrence. So, I mean, you've mentioned about understanding the pathway so you can target the secretion, but... I wondered whether you had any other theories of other sort of ways we could go about trying to treat these. And is that at the detriment of treating the other cancer cells that are present? So is it going to be a combination or, you know, how can we specifically target these sort of stem cells over the other cells around it? Oh, wow. <laughs> these are very broad questions, I might add. <laughs> no, no, I know. It's just that uh, I think... Well, it will depend to see if the stem cell compartment is the only one exc it's exclusively secreting these factors, then there could be one way of targeting them specifically. But if it's not the case, I'm guessing a combination might be the only option. Um, or if we have, if we can at least um, get a signature and that allows us to, in, in patients, to help predict whether this type of tumor or this patient will be more um, prone to have a recurrent or more aggressive tumor than to adapt the care. Um, so I'm not sure we can directly target one cell type if it's not exclusively expressing one of the factors. I'm not sure really. Well, perhaps also, um, Yasmin, maybe yeah. what you want, want to consider is that you've got the cell that is driving initial tumorigenesis, but in a tumor, you know, the, you, you get additional mutations, you have, you know, you, you then, parts of the tumor develop an entire life of their own, don't they? So you might be trying to, to deal with the initial problem, but that's not the problem anymore, necessarily. So something like you know the single cell the multi-omic approaches um that are now becoming slightly cheaper they're gaining you know more prevalence mm -hmm. to try to understand what the hierarchy is of the cells in the tumor would be very very valuable um because if you know we can't treat everything chemically necessarily but sometimes mm -hmm. you know sometimes this is the only option that there is if the tumor is inaccessible um, so I don't know what what are the thoughts I guess between all of you um, and and do we do we have clinicians amongst you? Sorry, I don't I don't know you. I mean, one thought I was wondering was what the uh, sort of beta catenin status and Wnt status of the other cells are. Because of course we talk about dedifferentiation a lot. So once a, a cat, so it could be that you have your stem cell that passes out signals. But then the cancer cells around it, they might have a designated function and are, you know, a long way down this pathway to becoming a, an adrenal cell or whatever. And what tends to happen is that as they become more cancerous and accumulate mutations, they step backwards to being closer towards a stem cell again. So it's whether, you know, whether you know what the status is of like the beta catenin, how much more stem like of the other cancer cells around it become as well. So can you go in with a one hit wonder and say, well, actually, all of the cells around it are now looking kind of more stem like or actually a lot of them still differentiated. So we're going to require other factors. And I mean, John might know this as well, because I know Wnt crops up and beta catenin a lot in the MEM1 world, because that's um, actually kind of menin feeds into that Wnt pathway. So there's lots of mutations that can help kind of with that pathway as well. So that's kind of where I was thinking with um, sort of the maybe combinatorial treatments or whether some of them might work actually on more cells than you would think they would originally. Well, you're probably right, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> no, nothing. That doesn't happen all that often. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but it could be a strategy to target, like, I think it is already a strategy. I'm not a clinician, but I think it is a strategy to use wind inhibitors 
to treat some other known cancers, but I'm I'm not sure how this will answer the question as to whether the cells become more stem-like or obviously they will acquire properties such as higher proliferation or or cell phase changes which will make a tumor look a certain way but again i am not sure how how this will help i, I don't know i think i need a clinician to tell us what kind of treatment all we can say is explain the mechanisms and how the signaling can be altered at the initiation of a tumor and then from then on just try to characterize each and and every tumor on its own and maybe just target the signaling pathways that we know are altered it's like because Heidi I think is the only clinician in there I don't know if she's still there I was just wondering Heidi whether you um have treated any of your patients ever with wind inhibitors and what kind of outcomes you've got from it Simon is I don't know if Simon you've ever come across that but uh, I'm guessing Heidi's our best bet for that hmm. if she's not disappeared <laughs> hear me can you hear yes. me yes, yes. Oh, good, good, good. sorry i don't know i mean i'm so sorry i'm in the car so that's the reason why but i'm listening um mm -hmm. so um oh my god how can i get out of here sorry i'm in a different window um so what was the question kate my apologies no it's just if you've ever treated any patients with wind inhibitors and yeah i know that mm -hmm. and what sort of responses you get from them yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 we have not. I mean, I'm very familiar uh, with the wind pathway. And one of the reasons is because I'm also uh, dealing with adrenocortical carcinoma in the clinic as well as in the lab. Um, and uh, it's always the question about, uh, um, you know, whether, you know, a wind inhibitor can have any anti-tumor activity. I know that there is one on clinical trial phase one. Um, for solid tumors as well, I don't because also colon cancer as well is one of the um, uh, uh, targets as well, targeting the wind pathway. I personally have no uses. I is one of the interests that I have as well. Um, for adrenocortical carcinoma, we don't think that only targeting the wind signaling pathway will be enough uh, for these tumors type, uh, but we have organoids for ACC. We also have organoids for other neuroendocrine tumors as well. Um, and we are trying to use some of the wind inhibitors in our organoids just to see if maybe we see a signal. But yes, it's an interest of mine, but not quite yet in prime time for neuroendocrine tumors, I can tell you that. Perfect, thanks. <laughs> Simon, I don't know whether you wanted to come in with any of your questions that you had before I keep uh, waffling. Yeah, I, mean, I, I might, I might uh, jump in here. But but it's more, uh, I, I will go a step back because um, I think the concept of stem cell and cancer stem cell is something that, that um, sounds very intriguing, but but it's always a bit difficult to uh, really understand what, what is behind these concepts. So on the one hand, the cancer stem cell. So, so one question of mine was that, that, um, that, that, um, that do you think that for the pituitary gland and the adrenomedulla, um, uh, that this is really a, a disease of stem cells? Or, or, or because this this was not entirely clear to me. So do you you think it's really um, starting from a stem cell, let's say a physiological stem cell, which turns into a cancer stem cell, uh, and then actually provides signals for other cells to kind of de-differentiate or differentiate, or or, or can you can you be a bit more um or give a bit more information on that point here? So I can tell you that what I think what happens in PPGLs is that because the tumors seem to be affecting both structures, which are the adrenal medulla and the paraganglia, and that how these two structures develop together along an axis, what could be happening is that somewhere along the migration and differentiation of these two structures, they could be getting hit with one mutation and then go on to develop normally and later on in life accumulate other mutations and maybe as then from then we would go from a stem cell to a cancer stem cell which will then give rise to tumors either affecting only the adrenal medulla or affecting the adrenal medulla or some of the paraganglia um, and depending on where on that migratory route the mutation happens could have uh, different effects on tumorigenesis later in life as this cancer stem cells accumulate um, mutation. Now, whether this will 
I don't well whether this is true, I don't know yet. And secondly, I don't know whether this would be a cell autonomous process, and what if this it's only the cells that will have the mutation that will contribute to the tumor, or whether they will signal to neighboring progenitors that have accumulated along the route will give this. This is also an option, or maybe that we will need to figure out. Mm -hmm. we, the thing is, is that we yeah. don't know. Unfortunately, we don't know yet. And this is what yeah. we're really trying to understand, is that at which point, when we induce the mutation, this will go on to generate tumors later on. Mm -hmm. Which point of development? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can, can, can I ask a question? This is Heidi. And I actually, I was asking, I had the same question as Simon, but one of the questions that I have is like, these perigangliomas, as we know, um, up to 45% may have a germline pathogenic variant. Do you think that maybe has something to do with what we're seeing here? Because, I mean, again, could we extrapolate the data of what you have done with other tumors, like you know, pancreas neuroendocrine tumors that have, you know, like the FGN1 patients and so forth? I mean, I, yes, I mean, I wonder what your thoughts about that. Yeah. Sorry. So the question is whether we think that. Uh, cells that have these mutations can have their signaling yes. altered and that, that this can contribute contribute to yes exactly with, because the, I mean, uh, like fios and paras has a germline pathogenic variant to 45 percent and you yes. mentioned about sdhp which we know sdhp is a germline mutation and i wonder yeah. if that may also contribute to what we see in here absolutely i think this is a, this is a very plausible this is a very plausible option that these mutation can in fact alter the signaling pathways of these cell lines and induce just like we saw in the pituitary tumors. Perhaps with the SDHB, um, because we're dealing with several subunits, um, we were discussing recently as well yeah. the possibility that, you know, you because you don't always get tumors, you have the mutation, you don't get the tumor. Some families members do, some others don't. The timing is different. Um, that it might also depend on the the efficiency of the variants of the other subunits. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can compensate and you you keep the levels of, of hypoxia relatively low or below a threshold, maybe you don't see any phenotype. And when that increases, then then that cell goes a bit haywire. Um, but we do think um, if we go from lessons from the pituitary, we know that the cells can contribute, the stem cells can contribute both directly and indirectly to tumors. But it's not the only cells that can. Every cell in the pituitary gland, and we've got multiple cell types, can be hit, you know, with a, a mutation in a tumor suppressor, for example. And, and you get that's why you get such a big array of, of different phenotypes in tumors. So we've modeled three types of tumors and in all three types of tumors the stem cell was the cell of origin but the mechanism was slightly different um, and in addition to that you've got all the adenomas of the differentiated the secreting cells are now renamed pit nets um, the pituitary adenomas which um, can be secreting any of the hormones and in 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 ppgl the phenotype is not as as variable in terms of the histology, in terms of it, the, the secretion, see that you get a lot of secretion, you don't get a lot of secretion, it will depend on the cell content. But I, I don't think that we have so many cell candidates along that route. We're down to much fewer, and in mouse, we can test each and every one of them. We can drive the mutation in each cell and ask the question if you do it during development, if you do it postnatally, if you do it, you know, at any time and you can combine mutations, do you get a tumor? Do you not get a tumor? I know the mouse is not a human, but at least we can manipulate the system to answer that question. But what will be, I think, really revealing is when we do drive the mutation in stem cells, what Yasmin was saying earlier, and, and, and John actually commented that we need, you know, we need the, the multicellular systems biology is do they themselves now form a tumor or is that a sufficient push in terms of the secretion for the other cells now to, to become abnormal? And which are the signaling pathways at that point that are affected? So hopefully we'll have some answers for you in the next year. 
But for, for that point, I, I would have a follow-up question because you mentioned the CAM assay, which, which is kind of a controlled system where you can uh, actually work in a bit more simplified way to, to um, uh, find out about the signaling or the, these points. And, and I was wondering, what is actually, is it known what is the growth factor or signaling environment uh, composed of in these what, chicken eggs, basically, or can you, I mean, because apparently this is kind of a stem cell niche there, uh, which seems to be physiological. So, so I was wondering if, if it's possible to, to uh, basically clear up this black box a bit or... or... Okay, so the because question is... There are a lot of factors you could, you know, study to see what... Well, what is there, which is might be a bit more tricky in a in a, in a mouse, I guess. Or okay, so okay, yeah. So the cam. What is good about the cam assay is that it's still a, a vascularized environment mm -hmm. where we have all the components of respiration, and it has been shown that the the chick immune system has very little um, effect on the xenograft and the cells that we put onto the cam, but of course. Uh, we can't really control what factors our cells see in that mm -hmm. environment. Um, but one way to test what you are saying would be to move in vitro in systems such like IPSCs where we could control all the factors and drive all the differentiation steps from our stem cells on one. And here we would have more of a control of what factors our cells see. However, mm -hmm. what we could do in a CAM assay to test whether this is a cell autonomous. We could imagine an experiment where we would get our stem cells, mutate them, and seed them in the camp and look at their mut uh, mutagenic potential. Or we could also mutate them and co-culture them with other cells that ha don't have the mutation and see how this, uh, to test whether there is any signaling or how the mutated cells can affect the non-mutated cells, either in this system or in a dish, so there's a lot of things that we can do, but it is a controlled environment, but not as controlled as a plate where we would actually measure <clears throat> our factors. Mm -hmm. But still, so the environment which is there from the from the chicken egg, is it known which factors are there? And can you basically extract those factors to know, well, this is the baseline. And if you put, you know, your cancer stem cells or, or potential progenitor cells or cells which then um uh, create the tumor uh, can you can you do you know what is there from 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 this from this physiological environment i guess it's more well, difficult to know what is in the niche in a, in a in a mouse or in a human you know in in, in for, regarding these factors which are there now okay. if you put let's say a few of hundreds or i don't know what a few thousand cells cancer stem cells or cells which have this secretion or signaling um, um uh, potential you know I, I i think this interaction will be interesting if you if you then change the the environment completely uh, okay i see what you mean that okay so to 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 differentiate what affects the cell what the cells see in on the camera from the, the, from the chicken basically and what how much do they impact then the this environment basically so maybe they secrete other factors which are not there but which are needed to um, create the niche where they can then start to grow as tumors. Yeah, this is something I would need to check in my future experiments and see what the cells see. Okay. Can I can I help out here a little yes, bit? Yes, because I'm not it's sure. Every developmental signal under the sun. So you will okay. have EGF, FGF, BMP, mm. sonic hedgehog, wind, retinoic acid. You know, it goes on and on and on. Mm. And it's it's because the the cam is like the placenta in humans, and mm -hmm. it's and it's also you know you're still receiving signals from the embryo itself, mm. and it's mm. developing very rapidly. Um, and I think over the time course of the culture, the levels of the signals change. Mm. But what we know is that they're in excess for the cells and they are quite permissive. But if you put a normal cell, mm -hmm. it's not going to be tumorigenic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So the signals are there and they're abundant. And if mm -hmm. the cells can see them, then they take advantage. But the normal cells not going to be influenced in, an, in, a, in, in a malignant way now. Mm -hmm. Right. It has to mm -hmm. be a, a tumor cell. Mm -hmm. um, but what we could do is be adding inhibitors. Mm -hmm. 
against these and you can very easily access you know because you window the egg Yasmin windows mm -hmm. the egg and then she can open it up and she can add inhibitors in and mm -hmm. prevent signals one by one so if you're trying to see what would stop the invasion in these mm -hmm. cancer stem cells you can then overcome whatever is the endogenous signal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's cheap and cheerful and, and sorry, just uh, I saw John has a question, but just a, a, a short follow up on this on this, you know, growth factor signaling. Is it also known? I mean, there are other parts in the brain which would show neuroplasticity. Is it known? Is there some kind of relation to uh, NENS that maybe signals which are needed for neurogenesis, maybe no go A and, and all these or, or they are rather not um, associated with, with neuroendocrine uh, cancer? I'm really not sure. Yeah. Not sure either. Mm. Okay. Well, John, do you want to go ahead with your question? <laughs> yeah, sure, thanks. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, I just wanted to toss out there that if you hadn't, I, I think that the, um, the colorectal cancer literature is where I've really heard about went and beta catenin, and uh, maybe that's been a little bit you know since there's more colorectal cancers, maybe it's a little bit more explored. Um, and of course, there's a lot of stem cells in the crypt, right? So that maybe there's something there. Um, and it's really great that you guys are looking at the development. I think that's really interesting. That's kind of a little bit of the background that I've had, but I do mathematical modeling, um, so um, that's just more like I've read about. And then that leads to my question. Uh, that I was really curious about that cell lineage um, testing that you did. That looks, how, how did you get all those colors? And what's what's going on there? And I know we're, we're close on time and we, I can follow up later, but that seems like the kind of thing that in a multicellular systems biology approach would be really interesting, right? We're gonna wanna be able to differentiate between cells and track what's turned into what. And so just, will look quite impressive as a way to to do exactly that. So the way so the way we to do this is that we we use a mouse model of lineage tracing. So how that works is that we cross a mouse that has a Cree driver mm -hmm. with a mouse that has um, an MTMG system, which basically is so when you cross, let's say SOX2 Cree with a Rosa 26 MTMG, so it's a new because this um, promoter all and you get uh, the, so a SOX2 Cree RT2 uh, Rosa MTMG mouse, all the cells in that mouse will be red. And then from the moment that the Cree is activated, you have the two locks B sites around uh, the, the, the tomato, the red that will go on, make a cut, and all your cells that have the Cree driver will become green. And this green membrane will remain even if the cell stops expressing SOX2, for example. So this by this way, and I have to mention that the Cree in this uh, condition is an inducible one. So you can breathe your mouse, your mouse is normal. And at four months old, you wanna test whether you have a SOX2 population in the adult mouse and you will inject it with tamoxifen. And from that point onwards, the SOX2 cells and all their daughters will remain green, even if a couple of weeks down the line, the SOX2 is not expressed anymore. So after that, you can collect your tissue and analyze it and stain for markers of differentiated cells. And if you see colocalization with your GFP and your marker, that you know that this cell, which has now become TSH positive, has derived from a SOX2 positive cell in the postnatal period. So this is the concept of the lineage tracing, but this is with an inducible Cree, but you can also cross your MTMG mouse with a constitutive Cree, so which has always been active if you want to do lineage tracing from the very early on stages where a promoter is expressed so that that's right. just one color yasmin but you oh, can yes. use reporters that are for example like confetti so you've confetti, got four yes. basal colors four colors that switch on yes. um and one basal three switch on and you could so you can do four color clones at a time okay or you can have them in homozygosity so you have four to the power of four if you use spectral unmixing so you can really be looking at individual clones and we we do that we have done that um and it's very interesting to study the cells but it it it's really laborious in terms of the analysis 
So we yeah, just, yeah. you know, we sometimes just, you know, stick with one and just give a low dose to moxfin and just label sporadically so you can see them all spread out and how they're contributing. Neat. Well, I'll, I'll uh, try to check that out when I get the chance. That looks like very powerful. Great work. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Okay. So one final quick question, I think, before we finish. Hi, um, my name is uh, Stephen Forsyth. I work at the NIH. I just started here as a postdoctoral fellow, um, getting into this field a little bit. Um, so very interesting to hear like these perspectives overall. And then uh, I had a question and kind of a comment. Um, so the question would be more for the mouse model itself um, that you're trying to establish um, kind of in the long term. Do you, because of what you're targeting, do you anticipate there being more off what we call off target like tumor genesis? So uh, target like let's say because it's stem cell markers, do you expect there to be potential colorectal uh, tumor genesis, genesis, um, and then maybe other pituitary tumor types? Because um, that's something I'm kind of worried about hearing this that you might be looking to try to establish this, and this really happens a lot in PNNs, for example, where you want a PNN. But because they take so long to grow and it's other things are being affected, those tumors will outpace them. And suddenly you're stuck with a great model for something else, but not for what you're really going for. Absolutely. That's a very valid point. And this is why we are planning on analyzing all tissues which um, contain SOX2 stem cells. And as you mentioned, the pituitary is one of them, as it's one of the organs we study the most. Um, but yes, we still expect to see a phenotype even in the earliest stages of tumor, even before tumor genesis, we're hoping to see how uh, these stem cells behavior can change even before the formation of a tumor. So hopefully we will be able to see something at the level of the adrenal and the paraganglia even before the whole body is filled with tumors. But yes, this is a very, very valid comment. Okay. And then my kind of other just kind of comment um, would be, we talked a little bit about WIT inhibitors. Um, that's not really a great route to kind of go down. Um, there aren't any clinically available currently. And there's a big reason why is that it's very hard to target specifically yeah. the tar your pathway, what you're looking for in that, because there's so many angles that that can come from. And a lot of healthy cells also require that. So the off-target effects are pretty dramatic. And I don't think they've ever made it past stage one clinical trials. A better maybe alternative would be looking at things like hedgehog inhibitors um, that are FDA approved. Um, and those exist. Um, nothing for, I don't think there's anything available for GI um, that have been approved, but at least that's something that it's gone through the clinical trial stage and is now available on the market for other types of cancers. Um, just to comment on looking at WENT inhibitors in general in preclinical models, it's just very difficult to get that where you want it to go and do it what you want to do. That's a very valid point, but I think where we stand is like we're very upstream of all, we're, we're nowhere near clinical with the very basic research of it. The first aim is to try to find, to make a model for PPGLs as there is currently none in terms of mouse models. And once we are there and we can investigate whether there's alterations of signaling pathways, we're not sure which one of the signaling pathways will be altered and then we are way ahead of that, but that's also good to keep in mind for future strategies. Great talk otherwise, thank you. Thank you. Perfect, well, I think uh, as we've gone a little bit over time, I'll just uh, say a big thank you. And I think, you know, all these models you're uh, producing are really, really important. I think, you know, people underestimate a lot how important the basic biology is to understanding these pathways so we can target the right things in the right places. Um, so I think it's really good all these models you come up with and, no doubt um, I will be in contact in due course because I think a lot of them for the MEM1 stuff as well could be <laughs> quite useful. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Selena, I don't know if you've got any uh, final comments before we disappear. Oh, only that was fantastic discussion tonight. Um, really good. Um, and just as a reminder that our next net chatter is the 30th of March. So I think we've got five weeks with March Um this coming quite early in February and right at the end of March, I think it's about five weeks time. So same time, same place. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you very much for coming and take care of everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.